Welcome to Wednesday Night Bible Study, and tonight we are in Romans chapter 5, verses 3 through 9, so hopefully uh, you have your Bible, and if you don't, uh, definitely get your Bible, because you're going to need it. So Romans chapter 5, verses 3 through 9. Let's take a look at that. We started uh, reading this chapter last week. Well, I'll start it back at verse 1 um, and read on down to verse 9. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and we rejoice and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation works patience and patience experience and experience hope and hope maketh not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet preadventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. You know, sometimes you have to go back and read the first few verses to get the context. And sometimes you even have to go back to a previous chapter to get an understanding of what's being talked about where you're at because when the Bible was written, they didn't do it in chapters and verses. They, it, you know, this was a letter to the Romans and it was written right through. And so we put chapters and verses to make it easier for us to find particular passages of scripture. That's why we did, you know, that's why we have that. But when they wrote, originally wrote this, it wasn't that way. So, you know, if you're writing a letter, which probably most of you don't write letters anymore, maybe some do, but if you're writing a letter to a loved one, you don't break it out. Chapter one, verse one, you know, how y'all doing? No, you didn't, you didn't do that. You know, you, you write a letter and that's what these were. This was written as a letter and we broke it out as chapter and verse. But here as we see the first part of that chapter five, when it's talking about being justified, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. We, you know, this is looking towards that hope, that great hope that we have, you know, of that day that we're with the Lord. We talk about that and then we look forward to that day. But it also continues and says, and not only so, not just that, not just that part, not just the part where we're looking forward to the time that we're with Jesus. We're looking forward to that time we're glorified with God, that, that time that we're with him. Not just that. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also. Now, tribulations... People don't really like that word tribulations because tribulations kind of makes you think about difficulty. And what that word tribulations is, thalipsis, is means pressure, that pressure, you know, and we don't like pressure. Pressure doesn't make us happy. The, you know, thinking about the glory of, of God and thinking about that day we're with Jesus and we lay our burdens down forever and we don't have to pick those things up again. No more trials, no more tests. And, and it, we, we look forward to that. But then looking forward to tribulations, that's kind of hard. Right. Knowing that these things come it says and not only so, but we glory in tribulations, not just that tribulations come, but that we glory in them. We rejoice How, in pressure. Why is that? Somebody wrote um, a quote at my work and they wrote it up on this board and they said without, uh, without, sorry, without pressure, there's no diamonds. And, and that's a very true statement. And so, you know, pressure is a good thing for us as Christians. You know, that, that trying of your faith, and this is what he's going to be talking about, but that pressure is a good thing. You know, that when you heat up gold, when you heat gold and get it to, you know, to that melting temperature, all those impurities, they float up to the top and they, and they skim them off there. They skim them off. And sometimes that pressure in your life causes that, that growth in Christ. When things are good, when things are not, there's no pressure, everything is fine, no, no problems, there's little growth in those times. Even though things may be good, you may say, oh, praise God, everything is fine, there's no, but there's no growth. The growth comes through the pressure that comes. That's where the growth comes from. Because in those times of pressure, you trust the Lord. You're looking to Him. In times of ease, you might... You know, set down your shield for a minute, set your sword off to the side, you know, take it easy and take a breath. But it's not a good idea because pressure is going to come for sure. 
It says here that um, not only so, but we glory in tribulations also knowing that tribulation worketh patience. So the first part of that is patience. Patience. It says tribulations, tribulation works this patience. Patience uh, patience is a neat word because it means cheerful, cheerful or hopeful endurance, constancy, like a constancy. I'm going to be consistent, you know, and it's cheerful, patience. So while the pressure is on, you remain cheerful. That's hard to do. Right? Because a lot of times when pressure comes on, what do we like to do? Grumble and murmur and gripe, right? Why is this always happening to me, right? But that's not what God wants us to do. He wants us to make, remain cheerful. Because if you're cheerful, right, in those times of pressure, that patience, knowing that God is able to, do, to deliver you. God is able. It's in his hands. You're in his hands. You know, what does it say next? It says, um, tribulation works patience and patience experience. What is experience? Where, where do you gain experience? It's after you've been in that pressure. And in that cheerful waiting and patience on the Lord, guess what? what? Guess what happens? Experience. You put to proof a trial. You test. You know, you're not testing God, but your trial. You know, it's a trial of your endurance in the Lord. You're, are you trusting Him? Are you going to put faith and trust that God is going to get you through this thing, or are you just going to? There's. Are you just going to say, "Well, you know, um, I don't know what I'm going to do." No, like, that's not a good answer. That's that. So think about it like this. Pressure comes against your life. While pressure is coming against your life, instead of murmuring, griping, you're trusting cheerfully, patient in the Lord, knowing that this time is going to pass. You're not going to stay, you know, in that valley forever. God's going to pull you up out of that valley. He's going to get you out of that, that time of testing. Trust him. Be patient. Endure it. Go through that, you know. And, and one other thing that is built out of that is as those times happen to you in your life as those times of pressure happen and you trust and lean upon the lord and you see his hand deliver you guess what that does it builds experience in your life i know him in whom i believed right i know he is faithful how do you know that he's faithful because you've been through that you've been through this and this and god has been faithful and he led you through you see and it says um and experience hope. I have hope in the middle of this, in the middle of this trial. I have hope because I know him in whom I believe. You know, so let's go back up to Romans chapter 8. Or forward to Romans chapter 8, verse 35. <clears throat> Romans 8, 35 through 37. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as a sheep to the, for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. You see, all of these things are going to happen in the life of a believer. Jesus never said that you would not go through things. He actually said that you, those who live godly for Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. You're going to have things happen in your life. But those things that happen in your life, it should make you trust him more. I trust him. He's, he's, I've never seen the righteous forsaken or a seed begging bread. I know that God is able to take care of this situation. You know, and that's those situations that happen. He doesn't, he doesn't overwhelm you or allow you to be overwhelmed, right? There are times where you, the pressure will come, and I didn't say that he wouldn't allow you, you know, he wouldn't put more on you than you can handle. Some people think that that's not exactly what he said. He said he wouldn't allow you to be tempted above that you're able to, you know, to resist, but he'd make a way of escape. Uh, so pressure is going to come, and more pressure probably than you think that you can handle. And what does it cause you to do? It causes you to go to God, to trust him. Moses, again, talking about Moses, he was in a difficult situation. In front of him is the Red Sea. Behind him is the Egyptian army. What's he going to do? In the natural, he couldn't do anything. But he could listen to God. And when God says, you know, when God said to stretch out your, your hand with a staff, guess what he did? Stretch out his arms and guess what happened? God split the Red Sea. And they walked across on dry land. Did Moses do that? Moses didn't do that. God did that. 
when Joshua went into the promised land, the river got, got stopped and they walked across. Did, did Joshua do that? God did that. See, Joshua, but the pressure was on as leader, uh, now leader after Moses of the children of Israel. They're looking at him. You know, if God's going to be with him, is he going to be with him? God was with him. And guess what happened to the hearts of the people in the land? They melted. When they saw that the Lord stopped the, stopped the river to let them cross, they're like, oh, no. <laughs> yeah. This is going to be bad. <laughs> you know, honestly, at that time, if, you know, the people living there, they should have just moved out. You know, yeah, they're coming. Plus, you know, it's time to go. They put the for sale sign up. Never mind. We'll just leave. Yeah. Children of Israel were promised that land by the Lord, and they're going to have that land. That's for sure. So uh, James chapter 1. I'm not saying that you uh, you have been or will be successful in every in everything that comes against your life. There'll be times where you fail, and if you do, go to God. Go to God. Don't run from Him. Run to Him. Go to Him. Confess your sin. He already knows. He's not going to be shocked. But you go to Him to be forgiven. Amen. James chapter 1, verses 2 through 3. My brethren, count it all, what, sad, sadness? Is that what it says? Joy. joy. Oh, joy. Count it all joy when you fall into divers' temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith works patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Lack, that means lacking nothing. You're not lacking because you have allowed patience to have a perfect work. So count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. When these things come against your life, instead of complaining, murmuring, griping, you know, telling the Lord, well, why does this always happen to me? How come I got to go through this? And instead of doing that, count it all joy. Well, thank you, Lord. I don't know what you're going to do through this, but I know you're going to do something great. And I'm just going to be patient. I'm looking to you for, to bring me through this and, and, and out of it. I don't know how it's going to work, but you do. Trust him. You know, it's, it's easy to say trust the Lord. Much harder to do it. Because then you've got to deny a lot of things. Like Abraham called, what, is it, what does scripture say? Call, he called things that be not as though they were. Is that what the Lord does, did? Call things that be not as though they were? That's what he did. He said God, God is faithful. To fulfill his promise. He trusted the Lord. And God fulfilled his promise. Every time. You think Abraham had it easy? You're 90 something years old. <laughs> the Lord says you're going to have a, you're going to have a child. And how about Sarah? That had been something else. You're going to have a baby. What? <laughs> no wonder she laughed. Why are you laughing, Sarah? I'm not laughing. Yes, you are. <laughs> yeah. God's faithful. He can do it. He can make things that are impossible with man possible because he's God. He's not tied to this. He's not tied to this creation. He's the creator. He runs this. That's how come he can defy those, the laws of this, you know, like the laws of of gravity. God, God's not bound by that. Philip, he's talking to the Ethiopian eunuch. Just baptize him, right? Next thing you know, God takes him and puts him in a town. Drops him off. Now, that's fast. The Lord, when they're in the boat, these guys have been struggling all night to get to the other side. As soon as the Lord gets in the boat, they're on the other side. That's like God moving them better than that yeah i mean there's been i've heard of other things like that 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 have happened that that are pretty amazing concerning some missionaries uh but you know god can do whatever he needs to do 
He can, he can make the sun stop right where it's at the whole day. He can back up, he can back the sun up. And everybody's still alive, which is amazing. Because either way, it's amazing that you, you centrifugal force, you know, the world spins a thousand miles per second. I'm just saying you just stop it. I mean, yeah. Yeah, yeah. There went my cell phone. <laughs> Is there coverage for that? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> There's no coverage for that. Sorry. Okay, uh, Philippians 129. Oh, praise the Lord. Don't think you'll find a plan for that. Philippians 129. For unto you it is given on behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. Does it say that? It does. For it, unto you it is given on behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. Wow, that kind of just goes completely against the name it and claim it, blab it and grab it, and, you know... Uh, you know, faith, the confession, you know, uh, what is it, power of positive confession and all that garbage, you know, it's, it goes against all, and why I call it garbage is I'll quite honestly tell you, it's witchcraft, that's why, it's witchcraft, you know, because they, these people are trying to make themselves God, and they're not, you know, this is a different thing from prayer, they're believing that their words contain creative power, and they don't, that's what the witches believe, though. Occultism, that's a, in the occult, that's what they believe. But here it says that, For unto you it is given on behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, which we do, thank God, but also to suffer for his sake. So, is suffering part of your Christian experience? Well, it is. How about that? So, should we be surprised when we could go through things? No. We should be grateful and thankful to God. Why? Who are you suffering for? For his sake. What you're going through in your life right now, that, tr that trouble, that, that suffering, you're going through for Christ. What did he do for you? He died on the cross. He took the wrath of God for you. So if we suffer for Christ's sake in this world, we're to be joyful. Thank you, Lord. It's not that we, we go out and seek that. But when it comes, and it does, because it comes upon every man and woman on the planet, whether you're a Christian or not a Christian, you will come under some type of suffering in life. When you come underneath that, for the Christian, it is not a hopelessness, it's a hopefulness. It's a thankfulness, not a thanklessness. It's a blessing, not cursing. You understand as a Christian you have to you have to praise him through every trial through every persecution through every bit of suffering through every sickness through every heartbreaking thing you have to praise the Lord and thank him because God knows best better than we do we're so limited on what we can see and what we know you know even the most the educated human being on the planet is nothing compared to the Lord in intelligence and, and understanding. All of us together, you could, you could pool all of our combined intellects together and we still measure at zero when, you, when you're talking about against a holy God that knows everything. Right? And so when people said, well, in my opinion, it's like, that's just ridiculous. What does God say? What does God say? Because his word is what matters, not our opinions. Our opinions don't hold water. And our opinions don't change anything. There's people out there thinking that they're, they think they're animals. You know, they think they're, there's people out there walking around. There's people actually getting tattoos and body modifications to become lizards or snakes or scorpions or, well, maybe not scorpions, but 
tigers and stuff like that. I mean, they think that there's some people trying to create them, make themselves into aliens, you know, doing all these, these things, but all they're doing is mutilating their body. It doesn't change who they are. Who you are is still who you are. Who, who God made you. No matter what you do to the outside, you're still that person. You can't change that. It's interesting. Okay, back to our study. Okay, and not only so, Romans chapter 5, verse 3, and not only so, but we glory in tribulations also. So again, this this about glorying, right? Glory in tribulations. Over here, we're talking about uh, we, we um, get, being suffering for his sake is part of our Christian experience. I mean, that's part of, of what we do as Christians. I mean, but it, where is God in all of that? He's right there. He never leaves you nor forsakes you. He's right with you. He's helping you through that time of trial and testing. He's, he is there in those times when your tears are coming down. Your tears don't fall to the ground. And, and they don't, they don't, uh, they're not unseen by the Lord. The Lord collects those tears. Those prayers that you're praying, God hears every one of those prayers. He's right there. He's right there with you. Jesus intercedes for you. The right hand of the Father. The Holy Spirit is within you. To empower you, to, to help you, to through, the, through all of those things, to remind you of what Jesus said in that time of testing and trial when you're going through the worst things that are happening in your life. He's right there to remind you of what Jesus said. I mean, it doesn't get any better. That You can't even, you can't even find somebody to call at, at sometimes at 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock in the morning. Amen? But you can call on the Lord. How many of you have woke up in the middle of the night and, and, and been burdened in your heart having to pray, feeling pain or for uh, maybe not your situation and maybe somebody else's has been burdening your heart and you're praying for them? Or maybe it is your situation and you're like, Lord, I don't know what I'm going to do. Pray. Talk to him. He's right there. God is good. It says, In patience, experience, and experience, hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. The love of God is shed abroad in our hearts, right? See, hope maketh not ashamed, because, because, why does hope not make it ashamed? Because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. Look at Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4. Verse 6. It says, And because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So, whose Spirit's in you? The Spirit of His Son. You have the Spirit. You know, if you don't have Christ, you know, if you don't have the Spirit of Christ, you're none of His, right? You, when you're born again, you have Jesus is in you and you're in him. And it's in the spirit of his son in you is crying out, Abba, Father. It's crying out to the Father in you. Isn't that neat? How does he do it? He's God. Amen? How about Ephesians chapter 1? Verse 13. It says, Ephesians 1, 13 says, In whom you also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after, you, after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Now, I'm going to break that down to you just so you understand what he's talking about here. Um, after you trusted the Lord, you, you, you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. You responded to the gospel. Amen. You, you said, yes, Lord. You repented of your sins, trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior. What happened? In whom also after you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. So the Holy Spirit comes to reside in you. The Holy Spirit is, it says, which is the earnest of our inheritance. He is that earnest. He's that, he is part of that assurance from God to us saying here this is this is assurance to you to, so you can understand that you have this inheritance that you have this inheritance this is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of a purchased possession he's going to redeem you from 
you know, he's going he's gonna, to, one day, your body is going to be changed. One day, you're going to be given a brand new body. You know, this is God's assurance to us that this is going to happen. Eternal life is yours. Why? Because you trust in Jesus. Not because of the good things that you've done, although you might have done a lot of good things. Maybe you've done great things, but it's not about that. It's about trusting Jesus because he's done it all. He did all the work on the cross for us. Jesus paid it all. We sing that song, right? Jesus paid it all. He did all the work. Our responsibility is to do what? To trust him, to believe on Christ, to confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our hearts that God has raised him from the dead. That's what we're supposed to do. See, I love the fact that he shows this. It's the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. I thank God for that, that, that assurance that we have with the Holy Spirit residing within us. We know God means business. Amen? Israel had the spirit of the Lord in the temple. Before that, in the tabernacle. And in, during the time of the wandering in the wilderness, during the day, the cloud by day and the fire by night, God was their cloud by day to shelter them from the heat of the desert. In case you don't know what region of the world they're in, that's desert out there. Their shoes didn't wear out. He fed them every day. He gave them water from the rock. He split the rock. I mean, matter of fact, that same rock is still there. The, the, what is so neat is coming down from that rock, worn into the, 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 worn into the surface. You can see the surface has been worn smooth by water. It's been, it's amazing. The top of the mountain, by the way, yeah, it's still burned. The only one in the whole place that the whole top of the mountain has been burned. And the rock up there, if you crack the rock open, the outside is burned, but the inside, the granite is still there. It is so neat. It's been burned by extreme heat. Well, that's called the glory of God came down upon that mountain. God is pretty amazing. Amen? Where's the proof? Everywhere. Everywhere. You, you know, here's the amazing thing. People say, where's the proof? You know, where's the proof of the Savior? Have you, have you looked outside? Have you looked at another human being and seen how amazing each person is, how God puts a desire in, into us, a curiosity to, to discover things, how we're, you know, he, he made us in his image, right? He made us in his likeness. We're not God, but he's God. But he puts these, these desires into us to, to know him, that we can reason. Your dog can't reason with you. Your cat may be the smartest cat on the block, but it can't reason with you. If you have a chimpanzee, you don't know what it's going to do to your house. Don't get one, okay? Because that you can teach them different motor function things to go press this button to get a banana, but that's not reasoning. Man can sit there and say, where'd I come from? Where am I going? What is this all about? I guarantee you the dog that you got is not thinking that. They're thinking, when are you going to get that cabinet open and get my dog food out? Because I am super hungry right now. A dog doesn't reason. Animals don't reason, people do. God put this into us. That's what makes it different. How many animals in the animal kingdom do you see constructing rocket ships to go into space? None. Oh, here's a better one. Like if, if dogs could reason things out, don't you think they'd reason a way to get their dog food on their own rather than waiting for us to get it out the cabinet? and get the can opener, right? Reasoning separates us. Psalm 22. Psalm 22, um, let's read it, starting in verse 1. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me, 
and from the words of my roaring. Let me ask you a question. Where did you read that before? My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Where did you hear that before? Jesus said that on the cross, right? So in the middle of, middle of being tested, right? Middle of going through extreme pressure, what was he doing? He's quoting scripture. He's quoting scripture. That's what you're supposed to do. That's what I'm supposed to do. When the times of, of extreme pressure come, what do we do? We trust him. We lean on him. We have his word. The word of God is what you use as a sword. Jesus is a master swordsman because it is his word. When he returns, he's got, what does the Bible say? Very descriptive about a sword, sharp two-edged sword made from his mouth. It's the word. He is the word of God. And that neat. I just thought I'd point that out in case you overlooked that before and didn't see it. I just want to make sure you see that. It says, oh my God, I cried to in the daytime, but thou hearest not. And in the night season, am I not silent? But thou art holy. O thou inhabitest the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in thee. They trusted, and thou didst deliver them. They cried unto thee and were delivered. They trusted in thee and were not confounded. See, this is an interesting thing because he says here that he's crying out. You know, he says that first part, oh, I cry in the daytime, thou hearest not in the night season, I'm not silent, but thou art holy. See, even when God's answer is not immediate, it's still going back to praise, giving God the glory, thou art holy, O thou that inhabits the praises of Israel. So it's not an accusing finger being pointed at God. It's a trusting, it's a trusting reliance on God, knowing that God, even though at this time the, the, the answer hasn't come, you're still under pressure. You're still going through that trial. Even though the answer hasn't come yet, God is faithful. God is still there. God is going to answer. And then it goes here to experience. Remember we talked about experience? Remember our whole thing? We glory in tribulations. Tribulation works patience. Patience, experience. Experience, hope. Right? Here's our experience. Our experience is our fathers trusted in thee. They trusted and thou didst deliver them. You did deliver them. They cried unto thee and were delivered. They trusted in thee and were not confounded. You see, understand, that's where experience and hope. Now, we know God's purpose, what Jesus did on the cross. He died on the cross for our sins. This was something that he intended to do before he ever made anything. It's not something that surprised him and came up at the last minute. It's not like us, how we, you know, don't plan well. God plans everything perfectly, and before he ever made anything, he already came up with a plan to redeem us from our own destruction. That's pretty amazing. If anybody ever wants to know, does God love them, point to the, the fact that he still made us. Does God love me? He made you, didn't he? You are breathing air, aren't you? He loves you because you didn't have to be here. God could have said, you know what? Not this person. And you'd have never existed. But God does love you. That's why you're here. He is just. He is loving. He's kind. He's merciful. You don't understand. Even the people that rebel at him, that, that shake the fist at him, that, that will never come to Christ, even them, God loves them. God is giving opportunity. He's reaching out. He's, he's always extending his, his, his forgiveness and his love. But you have to answer. What are you going to do? You know, um, Titanic... The tragic story about the Titanic, right? You don't know a lot about it. They were boasting that the ship, even God couldn't sink the ship. That's what they were boasting. But we know how that turned out on its maiden voyage, right? Pride of man, right? But as the ship um, hit the iceberg and they realized that they're in trouble, the people that were on the ship still weren't convinced that there was trouble. Even though the crew that was on the ship knew that this was a problem and they started getting lifeboats prepared, there wasn't enough lifeboats for everyone. These distress signals were sent out, but there wasn't a ship close enough. So 
the first lifeboats that were released by the Titanic into the water, the first boats went out half full, quarter full, because they couldn't convince people to get into the boats. They couldn't convince people that their lives were in jeopardy. They were going to die if they didn't get in the boats, and they could not convince the people because they bought off on the lie even God couldn't sink the ship. And a lot of people died. I'll tell you that in this world, this world is going to experience the wrath of God. It's going to happen. This world is in desperate trouble right now and doesn't even realize it. They are in jeopardy at every moment of every day. And they need to get into the lifeboat. They need to get in to Christ. They need to be in Christ. They need to be saved. He is the Savior. His boat can hold all that will come. But if they don't come, they will die. Not because God wanted them to. But the fact is that they just didn't believe that they were in any danger until it was too late. Titanic is a sad tale. But it parallels, it parallels our, our, our world today. As part of the crew, we know you're in danger. <laughs> and, and we're telling you, get in the boat. Get in the boat. Time's running out. The ship is going down. The world is going down. Get into Christ. There's still a chance for you to come to know the Savior. If you're breathing, you can turn to Christ today. Amen? Amen. Well, praise the Lord. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Well, Randy, how come, how come you, you tell us this stuff and it's so serious? <laughs> because if you're not serious about this, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to help you. This is life and death. It is serious. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Verse 16, now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us an everlasting consolation of good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. God will, you know, it says now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which has loved us, hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace. We have everlasting consolation and good hope through grace. I want you to get that down into your heart. Understand this, that today, that everlasting consolation, you know where you're going. You know, you know what, when you close your eyes that last time, you know where you're going to be. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. You know that. You have faith and confidence in Christ. You have given him your life, trusted in him. Know that he never, never, ever uh, lies to you. He tells you the truth every time. He's faithful to his word, to, to, to watch over his word, to perform it. You know, this is a good thing. A good hope. We know that Jesus is coming. We know that we've trusted him. We know that when the Lord comes back, if, we're, if we are alive and remain, we know we're going to get caught up in the air to meet the Lord to, together. Amen? Together, we're going to be caught up. If you've died in Christ, you know that. Guess what's going to happen? You're coming out of that grave. Coming out just like Lazarus did. Well, actually, you're going to be translated, so Lazarus wasn't. He just was brought back to life. But you're going to be resurrected. That's amazing. I... You know, I, I've said this before. I have to say this one more time, just concerning Lazarus, just observation. And I've said this, just think about it, though, for a second. When Jesus stood there at the, at the grave, right, and they told him to roll the stone away, right, he says, he says what? He says, Lazarus, you know, come forth, right? And then Lazarus comes out, still wrapped up in the grave clothes, right? If he hadn't have said Lazarus, if he had just yelled, come forth at the grave, everybody would have come. Because he has the words of life. I mean, he's, he's God, he's creator. It's just really cool. There's a day you'll hear his voice. 
I just love that. I love that. He knows you. And even though he knows you better than you know you, he still wants a relationship with you. That's pretty cool too. Amen? Younger folks may not get that. They're like, oh, yeah, yeah I'm sure, I think. I don't know what you're talking about. But older, you've been around a while. You understand that we're not perfect. You understand that our lives are, are not neat and tidy in this little thing. You understand that we need the Savior. And we're thankful for that. Man, what a good God he is. Second Timothy. Chapter 1, verse 12. For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. You know, we trust the Lord. That's complete trust in the Lord. I know him, whom I believe. You know, I'm persuaded that he's able to keep that which I have committed unto him against, the name, against that day. What have we committed to him? Our lives. We've committed our lives to him. We've given him all we are. I'm crucified with Christ. Identified, right? There's identification. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I. But Christ liveth in me. We've committed to him our all. We have given to him because we trust him. You didn't halfway get in the boat, right? You don't one foot in, one foot out. I'm going to keep one foot on the Titanic and, and try to get one in the lifeboat. We'll see what happens. That's, that's not a good idea. Get in the boat, right? If you're trying to balance on land, if anybody's ever been in a boat at all, a canoe maybe, or a boat, and try to put, come off of a dock and your, your one foot is on the dock, and you try to step in the boat and you try to balance between you, something's about to happen. You're about to get wet. It's, you're, you're going in the water. You're either all in or you're out. You've got to be committed. Amen? Okay. Well, um, we do have more to do, but we're out of time. So God bless you. We love you guys. We'll talk to you next time. Have a blessed night in Jesus.